for uh, coming and hearing uh, the presentation about the collaboration that John Hip and I have started in the department. We are technically called the Irvine Laboratory for the Study of Space and Crime, or ILSIC. <laughs> Not sure if that's what we want to be called, but <laughs> ILSIC sounds a little strange. But um, what's that? <laughs> um, we um, we are both co-directors of the of the lab. So I want to give you a little bit uh, of background information about the lab. We do research on the social ecology of crime at all levels of analysis, um, from all the way down to the micro level analysis of street segments, up to blocks, neighborhoods, cities, counties, and we even study uh, the social ecology of crime across metropolitan areas. And the goal of our lab, broadly speaking, is for our research team to generate high quality scientific research on the space crime nexus. And I'll talk, we'll be talking a little bit more about what that involves in a second here. And we also aim to foster intellectual exchange among faculty, graduate students, as well as undergraduate students. And uh, let me tell you about three key features of our lab regarding its mission. The first is obviously to produce high quality scientific research and we're going to be spending the bulk of the talk today describing the kinds of research undertakings that we're doing in the lab. But secondly, there's a very important component that deals with mentoring and the socialization of students. And this goes for graduate as well as undergraduate students here at UCI. So we have weekly lab meetings that last for several hours um, and part of those meetings involve things like tutorials and didactic seminars where we work with students to teach them about a variety of different methodological approaches or how to geocode uh, uh, data or do spatial analysis, etc. We also perceive our lab as a forum and these, these me weekly meetings as a forum for practice talks and presentations. Um, all of the graduate students and even some of the undergraduate students involved in the lab at some point will be doing conference presentations or practice talks and we use that as a place to give feedback and provide uh, support and encouragement for those talks and presentations. We also provide uh, feedback on grant proposals and papers. We highly encourage the graduate students and undergraduate students working in the lab to be submitting grant proposals and we give continuous feedback on those proposals. And it's not just the faculty, John and myself, but the other graduate students providing the feedback as well. And then finally, there's a component, we describe it as an age-graded mentoring role system, where we want uh, the graduate students to get involved in mentoring, especially many that are going to go on and become professors themselves. This is a good chance to learn about how to effectively mentor. So for example, we have many of our senior graduate students in the lab mentoring more junior graduate students. We've got more junior, junior graduate students mentoring first year graduate students. And then we even have first year and uh, graduate students mentoring undergraduates. So there's this chance to kind of put into practice a lot of the mentoring. And then a third important component or feature of the lab is that we consider ourselves a data collection repository. John and I have pooled the data that we have, and we are continuously collecting data that members of the lab can use for a variety of things, dissertation projects, second year projects, papers that students are interested in working on. And we are, at, John's gonna talk a little bit about this in the context of one grant that we have, but we are very quickly amassing a large amount of data on a variety of, um, of issues. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to talk about, um, give you some examples of the research projects we're working on. The first one, the crime in Southern California. Yeah, a little <coughs> tag team exercise here. Okay, okay. Right. <laughs> um, thanks, Charles. Char did a nice job laying out the, the lab and what the goals are of it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this first research project um, that we're doing. Um, it's funded by the NIJ. We just, just got the money, just came in not so long ago, last month or so, that we actually got it in hand. We're just waiting in um, The title of this large pro I'm kidding, but um, Crime in Metropolitan American America, Patterns and Trends Across the Southern California Landscape, uh, funded by the NIJ National Institute of Justice. Um, it's a very exciting project to us. Um, if anything, to give a little background, we, we sent the, the proposal, the, the call was like perfect for the work we're doing. We sent the proposal, and if anything, the first feedback was, you guys are trying to do too much. Um, take it back a little bit, which which we did. But what's uh, what we see this 
is um, focusing on a lot of these issues that are, are near and dear um, to uh, our, our work already. So we're examining a number of research questions in this project, so it's a very large scale um, project of what's going on. Um, the one, if you, if there's one theme, it's that we're focusing on Southern California uh, in particular. Um, and it's this whole region, um, but as part of that, trying to understand crime at these various spatial and temporal scales, as Charles mentioned. So one part of this project is collecting uh, point crime data. That's the term for you know the actual events and actually where the events occurred. And we're trying to collect that for the entire region, which at first, if I, you know, if I heard myself saying that six months ago, I'd say that's insane. There's no one who's done anything even remotely like that. Um, now it's, it's only somewhat challenging. Ambitious, maybe, but we're actually making a lot of project and uh, progress in that way. Um, and what we're doing then is combining that crime data with a large number of other data sources that we're we're collecting and have collected. Um, at this point, I should mention that why this call from NIJ was so perfect is I also have my, another one of my hats is I'm the director of the Metropolitan Futures Initiative, which is housed here in the School of Social Ecology. Um, the MFI, the goal of it is to bring, is to do interdisciplinary work, which is what social ecology is all about. Um, bringing people together who study housing, people who study transportation, people who study environmental justice issues, people who study neighborhood and crime, as I do, bringing us together. We were started on this project of collecting this large data set to answer these various other questions. The NIJ call came along and said, well, what if you were to, someone was to collect this, these data and ask questions about crime. So it was like perfect for us in the sense that we had already done a lot of this legwork and now we're just pushing forward with this. And as Charles mentioned, what we're gonna end up with is a huge repository and source that others can use uh, as well. Um, just to give you a sense of how far along we are in the collection of crime data, uh, this is a map where it, you know six months ago it was completely yellow, it was completely, there was no crime, no nothing. Um, the red areas here are cities that we've collected point crime data for. For some of them, we've only gotten a few years, recent years. Some we've gotten back to about the last 10 years, so we can really do some longitudinal analysis, which we're particularly interested in. But you can see we're filling in this map more and more and more, and there's actually parts for those, I can't point to where Orange County is, um, that's actually going to fill in uh, quite a bit more in the next several weeks. So we're doing quite good on this. And what you can see from this, typically, um, research will take one particular city and focus on the neighborhoods within a city and say something about it. You can see we've got the ability to do this huge, large-scale thing. If anything, it's been forcing us to have conversation pushing forward our theories, how we think about things. If anything, it's like too much data. You know, what, what do we do with this? What kind of, you know, there's questions we can answer, um, but new ones that we've never even thought about before, but that we can uh, approach and do. Um, so, that's the, the crime data we're, we're collecting and linking in um, with these other data sources. But then the question is what sort of research questions do we want to answer? And there's a large number of them. We, we categorize them under three broad categories, foundational issues in criminology, enduring challenges for criminologists, and then contemporary challenges. And so let me talk about, briefly, I'll give you just a sense of what these different um, issues are that we want to um, talk about. One is the dynamics of urban crime. Um, both of Charles and I are, are interested in how neighborhoods change. So it's one thing to look at neighborhoods in a snapshot view, what's going on, what, which neighborhoods have more crime than others, but what we're particularly interested in is, is the change in neighborhoods, both short-term and long-term sorts of change and what the, what, a, what the consequences are of that for neighborhoods. The longitudinal data we're collecting will allow us to do that. Um, a second theme that we're interested in is this notion of a microenvironments and crime, and others have done this as well. There's a literature looking at hotspots, um, which I always, okay, that's nice, but to me, that's almost like a first cut to say, here is a hotspot. What does that mean? How stable is a hotspot? Why is it here and not another place? What brings it about? Those sorts of questions are things we want to approach uh, with this data. So approach um, a much richer analysis, if you will. Um, crime prediction, which there's studies that are out there that are doing that. That's an area that we really want to get in by combining this good data with our statistical analysis abilities, can we get do a better job of predicting where crime happens? In some ways, a holy grail, and it's sort of fascinating to me. I was thinking Bill gave a nice talk talking about um, Bayesian updating and, and trying to make predictions of where things happen. Um, Bill and I are part of a little uh, informal group that's been studying Bayesian models, etc. 
to me, I'm interested in applying some of those techniques to understanding crime. Can I make a prediction, a probability, if you will, will where crime might happen? I don't know for sure, but can I get a probability of sorts? Um, and then part of this is looking at day and nighttime pro uh, populations. One of the graduate students in our lab, Adam Besson, as part of his dissertation, is looking at this in particular. We're also going to be picking up on that idea, following up on his lead, and looking at, at that a bit uh, in the lab. But to understand where, in the past, criminologists have just implicitly looked at where nighttime populations are, right? They take census data and say, here's who lives here. But what happens when people go different places during the day, and people do go around during the day? So that's an important part of the study, this spatial implication of where people are going. Um, a third foundational issue, if you will, is this notion of uh, local institutional resources and what implication they have for fighting crime. Um, one is voluntary organizations, what role they might play. Another one of our grad students in the lab, uh, as part of his master's thesis, uh, did a study looking at voluntary organizations and crime. Um, but in that, of course, an important part of that is the need to disentangle this effect. Right? We, we also might think that crime might affect voluntary organizations as well as voluntary organizations affecting crime. So what is needed then in that sense is longitudinal data, and that's indeed what he was working with for his project, to try to pull apart this relationship. We're going to be able to do that within this large Southern California setting. Also, what effect do parks have on uh, crime? Something we can also look at um, with this data, the data we've collected. Um, just briefly say what kind, what, what is so implicit in that you can see the types of data we're collecting is where a business is located, where all various sorts of land use is located, real, real retail, parking structures, parks, etc. So all this we have, all these types of questions we can answer. A second broad category is enduring challenges uh, for criminologists. Um, a big one that's studied over and over and over again is the notions of concentrated poverty, inequality, concentrated affluence. What effects do these have on crime? And of course, it's sort of well known, right? That's that crime is associated with some of these things. What we hope to be able to do with this richer data set we have is to really explore these questions in a little more, uh, in more depth, a little more in a more sophisticated manner, um, other than to say more poverty, more crime. Um, look at that too. Um, but then, so we've got measures of poverty where low income housing is located. With our spatial precision that we have with a lot of this data, we can actually do a much better job of addressing some of these questions. And implicit, you can hear spatial is should be my middle name, right? That's all of this stuff we're looking at, is what is the spatial impact of things? That's a huge part of our conversations. Invariably in the labs, we're kind of asking, well, what, what sort of spatial impact do we think these things would have? A lot of the literature just doesn't really address that question. We're constantly looking at the literature. I'm sending for one of our persons, James, go find out. What if volunteer organizations, if a volunteer organization comes down, what, what area would it impact? I have no idea. Anyone knows what we know. We, we can't figure that you know. So how do we model that? We need to know this. Um, spatial inequality in nearby neighborhoods. What effect does it have to have a nearby area? What impact does that have on the amount of crime in a particular location? We can look at that. Um, economic redevelopment and gentrification are of interest. Um, most studies, as I said, focus on a cross-sectional view of neighborhoods because the idea has been that neighborhoods tend to change relatively slowly which in general holds up, but for certain things, certain points in time, there's this, if you will, punctuated equilibrium where neighborhoods change and go to a new equilibrium. Well, that's redevelopment, that's gentrification. What happens in those time points? That's something we want to look at as well. And then finally, uh, another enduring challenge, the notion of immigration and other demographic population shifts, which of course is huge in the Southern California area. We've done work on this before, um, but this is the sort of thing that we can look at um, in an even much better fashion with this large data that we have. And then finally, contemporary challenges are something that we're looking at as part of this larger project. Things that are occurring in recent time points that bring uh, new challenges to criminologists, if you will. So one is issues around housing, particularly foreclosures, vacancies, been a huge part of um, the discussion over the last many years. In Southern California, now there seems to be evidence that finally the housing market is turning around, but there's been a large number of vacancies. What impact does that have on um, crime in various locations? We can look at that. We have information on the presence of low quality loans. To what extent do they lead some of these problems? We can answer that question as well. Um, another key question for this NIJ proposal is this notion of the clustering of social problems. 
So whereas criminologists, I might be interested in one particular problem, which is crime in neighborhoods. What happens when we take into account these other issues, domestic violence, mental health issues? What, how does this clustering of social problems um, impact a neighborhood overall? And that's a particular interest to NIJ for this, this project, is to the extent that we can combine data sources from different agencies to get data sharing, if you will, to what extent does that allow us to understand social processes in a better way? Can we come up with answers that we didn't have when we, before combining such data sources? So that's something we're particularly interested in doing. And then finally, um, the notion of ex-offenders in the age of uh, this mass incarceration, what impact does that have on neighborhoods in particular, right? It's, it's, and this, there's been a growing <coughs> understanding that this is potentially an issue. You know, ex-offenders coming back to neighborhoods might affect crime. But what does it mean when we've had this huge run up in imprisonment and now this huge number of people uh, coming back to neighborhoods? What consequences does that have? Sharis and I have both done prior work on this, but that's going to be a theme for this as part of this larger project, and it also is a theme that's going to lead into um, our second big research project. I'm going to let Sharis talk about that. Great. So uh, a second project that we're currently um, doing work on is related to realignment. Just to show of hands here, how many of you have heard about realignment? Realigning, okay, good, so quite a, quite a few. Of you. As you probably have heard, this is one of the, if not the largest uh, prison downsizing experiment in U.S. history. And it's happening right here in California. It's unfolding as we sit here. Um, and the implications or the impact of this policy on all sorts of outcomes is, is unknown as of yet. Um, but John and I are interested in realignment for obvious reasons. And we have a, a project realigning California corrections and the consequences for neighborhood crime rates. Given the interest, given our shared interest in neighborhood crime rates, a question we, we would like to know is the extent to which realignment, as it's been implemented, will impact community crime rates throughout the California region, particularly in Southern California. Uh, we have a proposal under review currently at the Haynes Foundation. Hopefully that will be funded. But if not, we will go somewhere else. <laughs> because this is such an important topic, we really are interested in, in examining it. Just a, a few comments about realignment for those that may be less familiar with this policy. Um, we've, we just mentioned um, ex-offenders in the age of mass incarceration. Well, perhaps California, um, in, in some cases, is, is more exceptional than many other states in terms of the, the amount of incarceration that's gone on here in the last several decades. Um, we've had very severe prison overcrowding in the state. Just to give you an idea of the scope of this, uh, state prisons in California are designed to hold a maximum of about 80,000 offenders. And in 2006, at its peak, we were holding over twice that amount. And this, uh, uh, because of that, we had horrible conditions in the prisons, all kinds of health and related issues. The Supreme Court ultimately stepped in and in their intervention with Brown versus Plata decision, they ruled that we needed to downsize our prisons in a very significant way and quickly um, to 137% of capacity. And we needed to do this in the next two years. And the state scrambled, but its basic uh, response, as you all know, was AB 109, realignment. And the goal was to realign um, offenders from state prisons down to counties to be dealt with more, in a more local way. In some cases, that meant building more jail space and putting these offenders in local jails. But in other counties, they're looking to alternatives to incarceration, such as uh, intensive probation and rehabilitation programs. And as I mentioned before, this is unfolding right now. This uh, went into effect in October of 2011. And what's interesting is um, if you read the newspapers right now, you will see all sorts of comments. It's almost impossible to open up a newspaper in the region and not see some sort of comment or prediction about realignment and its impact, particularly on crime rates. The assumption is that this will cause crime rate, right, rates to skyrocket, and that's something that we're interested in considering. So the project that we're, we've got the proposal for now will examine the impact of realignment on neighborhood crime rates in the Southern California region, contributing and building to this, this, uh, this broader focus. And what we want to do in an ideal world would be to examine crime rates in neighborhoods, 
pre and post realignment, so to do a pre post analysis to see how crime rates have changed. We are also interested in determining how crime trajectories in neighborhoods change in the months and years following, following the policy's implementation. This gets back to John's earlier comment about the dynamic nature of neighborhoods and the importance of studying things over time as opposed to cross-sectionally. And then finally, a third important element of, of this grant will be to assess the extent to which realigned offenders themselves are recidivating. Um, let me tell, move on to discuss um, some of the projects that we're actually working on uh, right now in terms of analysis. The NIJ grant and the, the Haynes um, potential grant are, 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 are efforts that we're very, very involved in, but we also have additional uh, papers and studies that we're um, doing right now. And I'll talk about one, and John will talk about two, and then we'll wrap up. But uh, the first one I'd like to, to talk about is our work on fringe banking establishments and crime. And fringe <coughs> banking establishments are essentially non-traditional institutions for banking that many people use. What am I talking about here? check cashers, payday lenders, and pawn shops. Maybe you've noticed in your community that there's been a rise in the number of these establishments. I like to give this statistic when I talk about the growth and concentration of payday lenders, which is that currently, and this is just true about payday lenders and not, uh, not check cashers and pawn shops too, that's in addition, but we currently have more payday lending establishments in this country than we do Starbucks coffee establishments. So that should give you a sense of the, the, the severe growth of these institutions. Well, yeah, that's, that's scary, because you know how many Starbucks there are. I think we've got like five Starbucks on campus, right? <laughs> um, well, we, there's been a lot of research that's looked at the impact of these fringe banking establishments on individuals and families. That's been well documented, and we know that they're deleterious, that individuals get caught in borrowing traps and continue to have debt issues with that, that it impacts families, etc. What we don't know is the impact of these establishments and their concentration on crime rates in communities. So a question uh, the lab is interested in is, are crime rates higher in communities where fringe banking establishments are concentrated? And there's lots of theoretical reasons to believe that they would be, and I don't have time to get into that, but that's the research question that we're interested in. In, is that the impact of these institutions on crime exists sort of controlling on things like poverty and unemployment and the sort of traditional correlates. And um, we're involved right now as we speak um, in a spatial analysis of the relationship between fringe banking establishments and crime rates in the Los <laughs> Angeles area. And in fact, we just we're doing analysis as of this weekend. This is just a, a little snapshot to give you a sense of, of what we're doing. This is a um, map showing the block uh, blocks or block groups block. block group thank you we're doing it we're running it at multiple levels of analysis here but these are block groups in the city of los angeles and block groups are essentially what we're de defining here in this particular study is neighborhoods defined by the census okay and you can see that in the city of los angeles the block groups that have the darkest shaded areas have the highest violent crime rates and the green dots on the map represent the locations of fringe banking establishments. And our preliminary analyses show, as, as is evidenced in this map, that there's a pretty strong association between the location and concentration of fringe banking establishments and violent crime in the city of Los Angeles. Now the question is, will that hold once we run a more sophisticated models that account for uh, you know, control variables as well as um, other methodological issues, but this is the this is the sort of thing that we're interested in. So that's a project that we are doing literally as as I speak. Let me turn it over to John to talk about some additional work. Thanks. Yeah, like as Charles said, these are um, papers. Like this next one, I want to talk about is something that's actually is just been has been a long project. Adam Besson and I, Adam, a graduate student here, have been working on, um, and it's about to be published. It'll be in the next uh, issue of Criminology. And a key feature is what, how do we measure a neighborhood? And you just heard Charles talk about block groups as a, a neighborhood. And it's a huge issue, how do we want to measure neighborhoods? And that's a, it's a core issue that I deal with uh, in, over and over in my research. So this, this, this paper we have coming out, this idea, we suggest the idea of egohoods, is referred to egohoods as waves washing across the city. And this is what we suggest as a new way to measure neighborhoods. So it's in some ways radically different. It, came out and give you the whole history of where this idea came from, but um, methodological issues aside, but 
these yellow boundaries, for instance, these are block groups, which Charles was referring to. This is one way of defining where neighborhoods are, these various block groups. This is the city of Chicago here. But there's all sorts of, if you read the literature at all, there's some, some in each triax, and then you use other measures. There's all sorts of different units that are used, but a, a common theme in all of them is they're non-overlapping, right? If, if you're in this neighborhood here, you're not in this neighborhood, or this neighborhood is distinct from that one. Um, the idea we take in, is completely radically different is to say this whole approach is completely not, is wrong to be the strongest statement. That's not the way to go. This doesn't map onto the social world, so why are we using that? It's convenience, but maybe it's not the way we want to do it. So what we suggest is this idea of egohood. So you can think, for instance, take this, this these smaller units here are blocks. So they're small units, and we think a block is, it doesn't make sense to divide a block. A block is pretty much a cohesive unit. We're going to use these as, as we said, the building blocks, so to speak, of, of, of neighborhoods. So you've got a block here, and we've denoted this, this red one, and then what we're going to suggest is that the area around it of some radius is what its area is, its neighborhood, if you will. And that's what we've done. Now we've, so we've drawn this red line. Is some, this particular one, I think, is a half mile or a quarter mile, I can't even remember. Um, that, be, that becomes a research question of itself. What should the area be? And, that's, and what does it mean to see the area in New York City versus the area in Orange County, which is more spread out? Should it be a constant area? Should it be different? The census does constant population, but we don't even think about that as criminologists, a lot of us. Um, but what is the proper area? That's been something that's forced us to start thinking about that. Different ways to try to measure that and assess that. Um, for a starting point, we used quarter mile, half mile, three quarter mile. Half mile works about the best, but it actually varies the types of things you're measuring. But so anyway, we said that red circle, that's its area for, uh, for this particular block. And that might map on what people think when you ask people, what's your neighborhood? Typically, people don't think in these terms of something discrete like this. Especially if you're living out at here. If you're really associated with these people down here, but not these ones in the block next door, typically not. That isn't how the social world works. When we talk about people's spatial networks and other where people spend their time, it doesn't map on that way. Um, but so again, we can do this. We go to this next block, the blue block, draw a buffer around it. Here's this area. You can see it mostly overlaps, but not quite. And we can keep doing that for all the other blocks across the city, and that's exactly what we do. We draw these various buffers and, and say that each one of these is an ecological unit. I don't know if you already mentioned this, but how did you select the radius of your... That's an uncertain. We, we try quarter mile, half mile, three quarter miles, what we did. That's an open research question. We just started as this. We chose those different ones, and then that's something we want to work further on. That's no how, what should be the proper area. We don't know. That's, no, um, that's something we want to push forward on. But so you can see that's what we do for the rest of the blocks in the city, same sort of thing. And you can see these other ones here. Again, this overlap. So you get this sort of, uh, a lot of spatial autocorrelation, people know that term. Um, but so we get this process. And we said that's, that maps onto the social world in a, in a more accurate way. And, and as sort of evidence of that in the paper, we did a couple things. One, we looked at predicting crime. And so if we use these units to predict crime, versus our measure, we actually do a better job, quite a bit better at predicting where crime occurs. That's one way. The other thing that we found was that sort of the measure of racial heterogeneity, but very much the measure of inequality, turned out if you use these units, inequality has almost no effect on crime. If you use our approach, it has a huge effect on crime. And we can get into a long discussion of how these are measured. Typically, people make neighborhoods to be as homogeneous as possible. That's as little inequality as possible. But in fact, that ignores the fact that if you have areas with very different levels of income right nearby, then in fact there's a lot of spatial inequality. Our approach picks that up. So that was something we found out of that approach, um, which was um, made it particularly useful for what we wanted to do. Um, and we'll continue using that. A second paper that we have, this one's got a, a re revised and resubmit working with another graduate student, Aaron Roussel. Um, here we were asking the question, and this is another key theme of the lab, is these, if you will, this, this, this spatial um, hierarchy, if you will. So in the paper, we're looking at the microenvironment and the macroenvironment, and how we measure each of these, and what are the consequences for the level of crime. In this paper, we're actually looking at crime, city-level crime rates. 
but we're trying to understand the spatial distribution of characteristics within the city, what effect does that have on the amount of crime in the city? So in a sense, it's a flip of how people in, who do multi-level models think of, think of the context, how it affects some unit in the middle. We're going the opposite way. Um, won't get into the details of it, but I'll just mention a couple little tidbits we found. One of which is what inspired this was the notion of Lewis Worth from way back when, who suggested population size and density and heterogeneity were these key features that have affect anomie and crime. Um, truth be told, most studies are not finding much of an effect, and most people have kind of come to the opinion that they don't really have an effect, especially population density. Um, we find a very different thing in, in that we measure them differently. We pull apart these two ideas. Um, and one of the consequences we find is that population density actually has a big effect. I need to point to this. These, these lines are different population sizes, which are almost on top of each other. So that suggests the way we're measuring the macro population environment has almost no difference in effect. But this is population density, which has a huge effect on crime. And typically, when people measure this, they don't find that at all. So it's a very, very different finding that we get uh, as a consequence of that. Um, so that's robbery rates. We get that effect. Um, one other crime I'll show is um, for, um, thank you, burglary. Motor vehicle theft is about the same, I think. But this is burglary. A um, couple features of this. One, you see the lines pop, are pretty similar, which says, not much difference based on population size. But two, we again see a huge effect for population density. And third, the other big thing you notice is how the effect in low density areas is very different than the effect in high density areas. And a, a fair amount of research out there focuses, there's you know, rural sociology studies that focus on here, and they say it has a positive effect. P studies looking at big urban areas find a negative effect. And then it's, the conclusion is, well, mixed findings. We don't know what the effect is. Our argument is that when you actually measure it properly, it is actually a pretty consistent finding. So that's another project that's going on. Let me just conclude by saying a few things um, about projects we've been doing um, throughout the lab. Um, four different areas of research. A key thing, as Charles talked on, about before, is that we both do work with graduate students um, and so that's um, something I want to point out in a lot of these studies that we've done. So we've done work on social disorganization and crime. Um, so you can see studies that first, the top two, or the top one up there, Charis has done some work with James Wolfe, who's a member, member of our lab. Um, the third paper down, Walter Steenbeck was a visiting scholar here from the Netherlands. He and I worked together on a paper published in Criminology. Um, that bottom paper there, Lindsay Boges, who's now at the University of South Florida, was here as a graduate student, worked with me uh, on a paper. Um, we've done a lot of work on networks and spatial effects. You can hear that sort of theme of the stuff we do is the spatial patterning. Um, those first couple papers there again, actually the first three, I guess, papers Adam Besson has been on that are uh, either printed in print or under review, or R&Rs. Um, Alyssa Chamberlain, uh, who's now at Arizona State, another proud um, graduate of our lab. Uh, she and I have worked on a couple things um, as well. And then we've done a lot of work in immigration, particularly Charis has done a lot of work in this area. Um, those first couple publications up there working with Glenn Traeger, who's a graduate student who just finished up here. Um, and then another paper that Adam Besson and I have done in the annals, and Charis also had a publication in that same annals uh, issue. And finally, we've done a lot of work on poverty and inequality. Um, I've done work with uh, Sarah Bach, who's a graduate student here in, in social ecology, Alyssa Chamberlain, and then Dan Yates and I have published stuff in criminology. So we've done a lot of work with uh, graduate students and continue to do a lot of work. Um, it gives you a bit of a sense of what the lab is about. Um, as you can see, a lot of projects ongoing, a huge data sets. We're very excited um, about what we're doing. Thanks.